Some films were harmed in the making of this podcast. From Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and the Palatial FYC Studios, you are listening to For Your Consideration, the podcast featuring roundtable discussions reevaluating the cinematic canon of past masterpieces and modern classics. I'm your host, Dustin Friesenham. And I'm Mike Josek. We'd like to give a shout out to anybody catching the show on iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Google Play, and if you stream or download the show off of iTunes while you're there, we strongly encourage you to rate and review us. Five stars, obviously, the way to go. Unless that's not how you really feel. I'd prefer honesty. Give us one star and say, man, stop having Dustin on the show. That guy's annoying. But if you want to support the show, if you're going there and reviewing specifically to support the show, that's the way you do it. That gets it up in the algorithms. And as I always say, in the eyes and ears of people who may want to listen to us, but don't know that we exist. If you're a regular listener to the show, welcome back. And if this is your first time checking us out, be warned, spoilers ahead. So what you're saying is I shouldn't go on there and rate my own voice as a one star. I just, I can't listen to my own voice. That would not be recommended. Show's also available on YouTube, so uh, probably should have mentioned that in the string of providers before. Um, if you're a YouTube person, or if you know a YouTube person, we're there. Although or you we, could just keep listening to us on whatever you're doing right now. Although the that Lebowski episode totally got blocked. <laughs> 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 because of the Bob Dylan song at the beginning. Or maybe it was the Gypsy Kings at the end. It was one of the two. So I gotta go in and, and tweak that. It's available elsewhere. Elsewhere. Just not through YouTube. Completely blocked universally across every region. <laughs> Anyways, we're here. We're back. We're here to chat about movies. One movie in particular, and that movie would be Dustin's pick this week, which was Mike Judge's 2006 sci fi dystopian satire. Idiocracy. A.K.A. that sci-fi futuristic film featuring the platonic utopia. Idiocracy. You say dystopia, but it seems as though they were like, hey, here's the smartest person in the world. Let's make him president. We've got our philosopher king. (laughs) And they do say ignorance is bliss. (laughs) So perhaps in a world full of complete no minds, (laughs) everyone's happy. Is that platonic? I don't know. I don't know my Plato. I'm just saying. I'm building on my ignorance is bliss comment. <laughs> Anywho. I'm building my own argument over here. You've got your platonic ideal over there. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who knows anything about... About philosophy, hit us up. We will learn. Hit us up with the myth of the cave. <laughs> <laughs> See how that works out for you. We'll talk about that when the Matrix comes up. And I'll reference the song by Dea Dova. It's a good song. So let's run the credits on this film and we can get to discussing it. Satisfying our intellectual curiosity as it is. So Idiocracy was directed by Mike Judge. It was produced by Mike Judge, Eliza Koplovitz, and Michael Nelson. It was written by Eden Cohen and Mike Judge. It starred Luke Wilson, Maya Rudolph, and Dax Shepard. Music was by Theodore Shapiro. Cinematography by Tim Surstedt. Edited by David Rennie, distributed by 20th Century Fox, and it was released September 1st, 2006. The film was not really well received. In some areas, it was critically well received. The thing was only ever released in like six theaters for three days, I think. So not a lot of people saw it. Did respectively for what it was kind of given the opportunity to do, but it has gone on to become something of a cult film. A lot of people do love this movie. Mike Judge's previous offering, of course, being Office Space. I think a lot of Office Space people probably really dig Idiocracy as well. And at least one person, in fact, exactly one person, voted for it for the BFI's top films of all time, landing it 546th on the director's poll, which is why I was able to choose it. (laughs) And as we do, just want to mention that we... Watch this on uh, DVD. It was the, I believe, 2006 20th Century Fox release of the DVD, which kind of honestly is more the official release than anything else because (laughs) they really orphaned this thing theatrically and uh, DVD was 
really where it's existed. It's where its life more or less began. Movie companies are really strange when they let politics really affect a film this much. I mean, come on. Super disappointing, though, because there's only, like, five deleted scenes on the movie. There's no EPK stuff. There's no commentary. I mean, doesn't surprise me because the movie was orphaned, but considering it's a cult hit, considering Mike Judge's previous office space and the bonus stuff that sort of came along with that movie, the DVD feature guy in me, it's kind of sad. Anyways, this was neither of our first time watching the film, but Dustin, as this was your pick, and as we traditionally start with you what did you think of mike judge's idiocracy this film was recommended to me by a few people as a uh, the political satire that it most certainly is and i enjoyed it both times and one thing that is a selling point of all satire all good satire is that it's a little too accurate in some places <laughs> <laughs> just the world that they build there's a lot of stuff that, of course, doesn't make a lot of sense. You have people that are so dumb you don't understand how they necessarily tie their own shoes or do anything. You have sort of the conceit that, okay, scientists set up a lot of stuff that's super automated for these people before they all presumably died off for whatever reason. Effectively, the Voluntary Extinctionist Club, as per the uh, segment at the beginning explaining how the dumb sort of outpaced the, the intelligent... But as long as you don't worry too much about how they're actually building combustion engines when they have to do all their hospital stuff via shiny pictures and nobody knows how to read, you see things like advertisements on absolutely everything. I remember reading an article about uh, baseball fields, I think it was, shown in the future as having ads as being something sort of dy dystopian. And nowadays, you're not going to go to like Wrigley's Field and not see ads for stuff. People are selling the names of stadiums for companies. So why wouldn't people eventually start doing that with Mountain Dew Comanche? <laughs> Here you had ads on people's clothing, on their... Oh, for sure, for sure. Lampshades. The one Secretary of Defense kept saying, brought to you by Carl's Jr. <laughs> in order to make extra money. Oh, Secretary of uh, State, yeah. David Herman. Why do you keep saying Carl's brought to you by Carl's Jr.? Because they pay me every time I say it. Man, for the world's smartest guy, you're dumb. <laughs> and a lot of that just, it it feels a little too accurate. And it probably shouldn't feel more accurate after, you know, 10, 13 odd years of the show going on. <laughs> I do think that, I mean, while accurate, sometimes it's almost a little too over the top. But that's also the point of it being a comedy. It's... uh you look at stuff like A Modest Proposal, and of course, yeah, it's satire, but it's over the top. That's a big part of satire. Hell, Stephen Colbert's whole bit <laughs> is over the top. <laughs> Before we watched the movie, I said that the last time I saw the movie, I didn't love it. And I was disappointed with it. And then I was really curious about how I was going to react to it this time, and found that I had the exact same reaction to it this time. <laughs> <laughs> I was reacting to some things differently. I was actually appreciating some of the humor more, but also disliking other things that I probably wouldn't have been as bothered by in 2005, 2006. I know the language got you a little bit at the beginning whenever he'd speak intelligently. It's like, stop talking like a fag. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of faggy comments and there's a lot of retard comments. And while I understand... The world that judges created and that this is probably something that would be said or something that would be part of the everyday kind of lexicon. I still kind of feel like judge is smarter than that. And I kind of juggle or, or wrestle with the idea of is it being used because this is what judge thinks everybody would be saying or is it being used because 15 years ago that's what people would say when you were being smart or something like that it's something that we use as an insult nowadays and it is a dumb insult to really make so i actually completely forgive it because the only people who will ever say that are these incredibly stupid people to describe somebody who's far smarter than them in a, in just an incredibly stupid way and that's what i wrestle with when it comes to the language because 
I feel that the creators are smart enough. I mean, Eaton Cohen has written two other comedies that I absolutely love, Tropic Thunder and Men in Black 3. And Mike Judge is responsible for Office Space. And, you know, honestly... At the same time, he's also responsible for Beavis and Butthead. Oh, I was just going to say, (laughs) Beavis and Butthead is by no means highbrow, but it owns what it is. You know what I mean? I feel like there's an imbalance in the comedy of the mo- in this movie, of the language of this movie. I don't know if it's laziness. I don't know if it's period. I don't know if it's ironic or on the nose. It just, I don't know. It that's tweaked that's me. the trick with satire. But one thing I can say about both it and uh, sort of the excessive sexualization of women at times, it only happens a few times and then it moves on. They mention the whole talking like a fag while he's in court, but then they pretty much stop after that. For the next two-thirds of the film, it's not brought up again. They show pretty much every single business suddenly becoming... Uh, butt the, fuckers and... That was actually right at the beginning, <laughs> where over time, butt buckers becomes... It, it keeps fud changing. Ruckers. Fud ruckers. Just, Eventually it, turns into butt fuckers, yeah. <laughs> but... There's a number of places that become effectively massage parlors with happy endings to when you're doing your taxes, getting your Starbucks and so on and so forth, selling a bunch of stuff with sex. I actually really enjoyed how the news was still read professionally, but by a, the two people who are... Totally built. Totally built, super naked, but they're speaking pretty much normally almost. <laughs> there's there's a little hint in there, but... You those got, those were those weird things. inconsistencies. Just to close out that argument or that uh, concern, I guess, I do feel at this point that it was probably used, much like you were talking about the sexualization, that that is what this class of people would probably be thinking like, talking like, because it's not sophisticated, it's not mature. Um, I'd say it's a jab at people who would talk like that. And yeah. And as I said... I think I would probably... I appreciate, that, I appreciate that it's not overused. No joke, no thing that they really go with is ever too, too overused. They joke about Maya Rudolph's character being a prostitute. And the one joke that lasts the longest is how he just doesn't grasp that she actually was a prostitute, thinks that she was a painter the whole time, never clues in. I'm pretty sure by the end of the film, he still hasn't clued in. <laughs> <laughs> but... When others who know that she's a prostitute, that joke, they also don't wear that thin. They they bring it up when they bring her over the first time about uh, whether or not she's tricking people by offering sex but then not putting out, which is really bad business practices. You could bring her up to the Better Business Bureau. I did think that whole sequence with, uh, so can you wait a whole day? And he's like, oh, baby, I could wait two days. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> See, that's the kind of thing where, like, that moment, that humor, and that delivery, it's absolutely bonkers ridiculous. But because it was, I don't know, the logic of it worked in that moment, it seemed very, like, in-world, and the people who were performing it, again, like, owned it. Whereas I think there's a lot of other stuff where it's just absolutely ridiculous for the sake of being ridiculous. And it's just people acting dumb to far too great an extent. And it becomes dumb as opposed to clever in its execution. And I almost feel like it was Mike Judge, uh, you know, hiring. I mean, there's a lot of talented comedic actors in this movie hiring a bunch of people to come in with a script, but then... You're acting dumb, so, like, just kind of make shit up. Like, there's stuff that Dax Shepard is doing, which it just, I don't know, it has no sort of internal logic or consistency. And there's a thing to to stupid comedy. If you're writing stupid comedy in a stupid way, it doesn't land. You know, the best comedy is, like, really smart people writing really stupid things. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like... That's what should be happening here. And there's some cognitive dissonance somewhere. Like something is breaking down in the process because while I love the movie conceptually and I think there's a lot of funny shit in this movie, watching Beef Supreme at the end. (laughs) (laughs) Where he's egging on the crowd. (laughs) 
are they this way and the whole crowd no he's that way he's that way <laughs> like that's the kind of thing that why does that land i don't know why that lands so well but then it's like watching something else Blue's doesn't lose or some shit like that yeah he knows how to play the crowd in a really dumb way and it's or, ridiculous or the meeting of the the uh secretary of state and the secretary of education and all of them at the table Luke Wilson is trying to convince them that they need to get rid of the Brondo and use water. But Brondo has electrolytes. That's and they what just plants crave. <laughs> they just keep working through that. It's what <laughs> plants crave. It's electrolytes. And But why do they put the electrolytes in it? And there's like a <laughs> vaudevillian sort of rhythm to it that works really well. And those guys are just riffing and it's perfect. And I don't know if it works maybe because it's more tightly scripted and there's maybe less improvisation and just sort of let the person go and see what happens or if maybe it's just a moment where the actors are just really doing well together i don't know and that's ultimately the biggest failing of this movie is that it's very unbalanced the scenes that i find i like the best are when luke wilson or Maya rudolph are trying to explain something or recognizing just how stupid people are and they're just i don't even know what's going on here and they get that look on their face and you can see it sometimes in the background it's like, what? what is even happening right now? And it's their interactions with this absurd world around them that works generally a lot better than idiots interacting. Yet sometimes the idiots interacting, it's great. Like, as you said, Beef Supreme in the, in the yard there. Or when uh, Dax is going out and he's with the cameraman. He's like, oh, man, you like money, too? What are the odds? Like, we should, we should hang out. <laughs> See, that's funny. <laughs> But then when they get distracted by the Starbucks and they go in for a hand job because they can't remember that they're there to film the crops. That's stupid. It's <laughs> stupid and it doesn't land for me. No, I, I would agree entirely with that. And it's it, it almost feels like it's there specifically to service the plot. To make it look like, oh, look, to make it more a bit frustrating. of suspense. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing is just a really well executed joke. So, it's actually, it's like really quiet joke too. You can barely hear it. You got to be paying attention. <laughs> and speaking of Luke Wilson and Maya Rudolph, they're so well cast. They're both funny and likable. Like Luke Wilson is always the best everyman. There's and that just... is his whole goal here. He is the most <laughs> average person ever to have existed. <laughs> There's just something about Luke Wilson and his delivery that's just so calm and so average, as you said. And. Maya Rudolph so frustrated. <laughs> and Maya Rudolph does a really nice job of playing this prostitute character who never sinks entirely into cliche, but also never turns out to necessarily be, you know, the prostitute with the heart of gold or she's actually way smarter and she's just been doing this because of like like she understands. She's not she's some weird fairy tale sort of version of the character. She takes advantage of this new world that she's in in order to do better for herself at the end before she was quite willing to sell out luke wilson until he helped her out so she might not be the secret genius hooker with a heart of gold but she's a perfectly reasonable person who's taking advantage of an opportunity absolutely and that's something that i really appreciated about her character because so often you have you know the scoundrel with the heart of gold or the hooker with the heart of gold or the, the some character who's actually a malcontent, but they end up having a heart of gold and they come in at the end and blow up the Death Star or break you out of jail or, you know, whatever the hell it is. And that's fine if that's like a character arc that is well written and executed. But if it's not earned, it just bugs the shit out of me. And the fact that... And this is earned. She... The only thing that seemed to have kept her in prostitution is fear of... Upgrade. Upgrade. <laughs> Sorry. It's how upgrade is spelled. <laughs> Two Ds for the double dose of his pin. <laughs> U-P-G-R-A-Y-E-D-D. <laughs> Who makes a surprise showing right at the very end. In the post credit sequence, yeah. And, like, if I didn't make it clear, I, I like Maya Rudolph's character. I like what they do with her. I think everything is earned. Oh, 100%. Um, I like the chemistry that she has with Luke Wilson. Out of the trio, unfortunately, I think Dax Shepard is like the weakest link. Easy. Especially since every idiot in the movie is 
so generic you can pretty much exchange them with anyone else that's true they're all just weird stereotypes though the different jobs had different kinds of weird stereotypes all the police spoke in a very specific dumb way <laughs> in a very particular individual kind of way <laughs> Comancho was pretty much the one standout he'd speak almost reasonably sometimes and of course I just love Terry Crews he was an entertainer. I mean, he was a championship wrestler. Five-time world title holder. <laughs> Did you just hold four fingers up? <laughs> <laughs> the thumb was hidden up behind it. <laughs> Why'd you have to tell them? <laughs> they wouldn't have known. We should laugh less. We get criticized when we laugh too much. Edit it out for me. That's your job. <laughs> Why do you guys laugh so much? What's so funny about this movie? <laughs> This is a comedy. We're supposed to laugh. And I just did something stupid. <laughs> mm. I know it's also nitpicky, but we were kind of talking about some of the more plot hole kind of stuff. Like, how do they build the world's biggest vehicle ever made for Beef Supreme when half of them can barely read? Now, you have the stuff like all the automation, and that makes sense to an extent, but... Building new things. Building new things, that doesn't work. You, like, having having the skyscrapers literally duct taped to each other, and you can see in the skyline that a lot of them fell down, and they were all just like, well, I guess that's the way it is now. Yeah. Whatever. That makes perfect sense. I can get behind that. But then all of a sudden, you've got a whole lot of stuff which isn't automated. How does that all work? Now, you can always assume that they just have buttons that you push, like, ah, uh, bigger, bigger, bigger. But even their Roomba was cleaning that one spot, like, forever. Like, they very much set up this scenario <laughs> that when something gets broken, it doesn't get fixed. And beyond that, I mean, a huge, a huge plot point in this movie is let's use water to grow crops. You mean from the toilet? Exactly. And I'm not even going to get into... The fact that the soil was, like, ruined to begin with <laughs> and just adding water shouldn't help because whatever, it's a goofy comedy. But the actual act of having to change the whole system to get rid of the Brondo in the pipes, which is going to fuck up the pipes, first off, because it's salty friggin' electrolytes, and replace it with water, like, that would take... I wouldn't know how to do that. But even beyond <laughs> that... Diverting all that... The Secretary of State, David Herman, his character is always there with, like, a big doobie. If they can't grow plants, how are they growing weed? <laughs> <laughs> how is there... I mean, the stuff that they're eating, it's like fried chicken, it's like cheese, <laughs> liquid cheese. There isn't a lot of salads, so it's like, that's, that's fine, that holds up. But then anybody who's smoking anything, I'm sorry, it's nitpicky. Yeah, man. I but mean, it, it stands out to me. How long does it take for tobacco and weed to go bad? Honest question. I, I sincerely do not know. <laughs> I think, I think weed left too long that's too dry is not good. I know in Ash vs. Evil Dead, he's left like spliffs hidden behind things in the high school, and he comes back and he smokes them up, and he's just whatever. Hey, this is great. I don't think you can actually do that. I feel that wouldn't work as well. I think really old weed, I think you tend to like green out or get sick on it or something. Anyways, that's another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Which means they can come and tell us the answer instead of us postulating all night. You mentioned the building of the biggest monster truck vehicle and that made me think of the visual effects and the, the skyscrapers and stuff. The visual effects of this movie, clearly done on a budget, a lot of digital stuff. It has this... <laughs> almost adult swim like quality to it it looks goofy it looks goofy but that's one of those things that has a consistency to it so that i'm okay with it because it's actually pretty good for what it is the and trash you, avalanche at the beginning like right that's a lot of detail in this <laughs> and the digital matte paintings and stuff they're actually quite great the production design the art direction in this movie surprisingly good it was shot, I think, in Austin, uh, Mike Judge's hometown and surrounding area for the budget they had. I'm really impressed with how much they actually accomplished because 
at no point do I look at this movie and think, you know, oh, they just repurposed a street in wherever. Like, it's dressed. It's fully dressed in period facades and weird vehicles that had to have been built for that purpose because nobody has vehicles of that size. <laughs> oh, I think those might have been repurposed uh, like uh, smart cars with it would have to be things built around them or whatever. But yeah, I was really impressed with that. Like I, I believed in the world that they created. I just wish it was written better. <laughs> <laughs> you did enjoy the music though, especially when they come up with uh, some Planet of the Apes sounding stuff. Oh yeah, when they're like running away, uh, they go to check out the crops. And uh, he takes Maya Rudolph kind of off into the bushes to to look at a map that Dax Shepard drew them to take them to a time machine, which is what they believe is going to be their, their way back home. The composer is doing this thing, which sounds very much like a Jerry Goldsmith, Planet of the Apes kind of score. And I just really got a kick out of it. It's It's this little musical gag, which really works for me. But yeah, there is a lot of weird inconsistencies and stuff that doesn't quite work you've got all the off ramps are just completely decayed because bridges are extraordinary extraordinarily complex to create they only last about 90 to 100 years if built properly and so they're all falling apart okay i can get behind that and yet you've got this costco which is the size of a small state and it's got trains inside of it and it's got basically its own shanty towns who's building this stuff Who's building all these couches that are inside this Costco where the greeters have gotten to the point where they just love you? (laughs) And I'd be willing to accept that if they created a world where everything was... Actually, this would have been a really interesting plot point if they had sort of leaned into it where everything... Nothing new was being built. Everything was just inherited. It was like legacy technology, stuff that was just moving forward. And when stuff broke it was gone and they just kind of moved on with whatever they had next. So you'd have old things basically being used until they were, until they were run into the ground. But, but it's a 500-year st- gap. You had stuff that was completely brand new, right beside stuff that was completely old. So many buildings, just the wall was broken, and it's like, well, that's just the way it is now. Like, wall is simple. Put thing there. <laughs> and yet you have brand new lampshades and clothing with all these logos on it hiring and firing is done automatically apparently and somehow brondo in spite of the fact that they do basically drinks for absolutely everyone everywhere when they stopped watering the crops with it their share went down to zero which is not anything that makes any sort of economic sense but it also implies there's a stock market (laughs) (laughs) so who's buying and trading on the market And supposedly it's done automatically. (laughs) There's a whole lot of complex things here that that it's it's all fridge logic, though. If you go back, you just got to you just got to accept it. You just got to live with it. Just keep going. But the reason why it's easy to do the nitpicking is because if it was written better, I mean, the satire is on point. The, The world building is on point. The casting is on point. Like so much of it is on point. But because the writing is inconsistent you think about the other things you can't help it (laughs) i have seen worse movies that i nitpick less (laughs) (laughs) and it's by no means not an entertaining film oh no we were both laughing a fair bit throughout the film i'd recommend it to many a person there's one last thing i wanted to talk about how if they don't use water for anything but toilets how is it that everyone is still so clean if their shower is presumably spraying out brondo See, this is the kind of thing. (laughs) You start peeling back the layers and it doesn't work. Laundry. If you do laundry with Gatorade, it's not going to work. They show cars being washed with Brondo. Crops being washed with Brondo. It's coming out of water fountains. And is there no more rain? I guess if there's no crops... eh, No, you'd have to have rain. There'd have to still be rain, although maybe... Heck, even the talking about how the power plants, the nuclear power plants, are failing. And they're aware of this. And somehow they're aware enough about how a nuclear power plant works to know that it's failing. I weirdly want to see what's going on in Florida with the nuclear power plant failing. Because I feel like there'd be like some mutant horrible thing going down. 
with all the radiation and the toxic waste. I'm actually amused that uh, The Last Man on Earth, like a few other uh, post-apocalyptic shows, have brought up the whole nuclear power plants failing when no one's there to maintain them. And they seem to do a pretty good job of being accurate. They look at, you know what, gasoline, they had to stop using that after a season or two because it doesn't last that long. So they moved on to diesel and now they're kind of screwed for how they're getting around in vehicles in the show they have that attention to detail so if that is the case the map they showed of nuclear power plants across the united states kind of says that in this world they're screwed (laughs) it's everywhere it's not just florida where one plant is going it's all over the friggin states especially since they would have built more yeah i mean there's 500 years between when the film takes place 2005 and when we rejoin our characters in 2505 so like there's a lot of progress that happens in between it doesn't all fall apart at once so you gotta expect stuff especially to power all this automation that they have going on at least global warming or climate change hasn't affected anything i would almost want to see this as like an animated series to be able to explore this world isn't that what wally was I don't think I don't think live action would be as good. I don't know cuz I think it would be too expensive, but I'd go for an animated series. And it's Mike Judge. Mike Judge knows animation. He can do low quality animation too. That works for me. Beavis and Butthead style, Daria, whatever. Mike Judge didn't do Daria. Daria was a spin-off though. No, it wasn't. Yeah. A spin-off of Beavis and Butthead. Get out. Check it out, man. All right, I'm googling that shit when we're done. <laughs> All right, I don't really have anything else to say about this film. Do you want to add anything, or do you want to go right into the judgment phase? We can go into the judgment phase. We will judge, judge. Judging the judge. He's not a judge. Come on, man. And we don't mean Reinhold. Something about a banana and a car exhaust. (laughs) Nice Beverly Hills cough reference. Uh... I'd hate to mess up that high five. (laughs) I've never seen Beverly Hills Cop. I'm actually referencing Clerks, which was the Clerks, the animated series, which was referencing Beverly Hills Cop. (laughs) All right. (laughs) There's reference inception happening here. (laughs) (laughs) It's like the people, a whole generation of people who know their culture from The Simpsons. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they haven't seen Citizen Kane They haven't seen Planet of the Apes But they know all this stuff For the last time I'm pretty sure what's killing the crops Is this Brondo stuff The Brondo's got what plants crave It's got electrolytes So wait a minute What you're saying is that you want us to put Water on the crops Yes Water Like out the toilet Well I mean it doesn't have to be out of the toilet But, but yeah that's the idea But Brondo's got what plants crave. It's got electrolytes. Okay, look. The plants aren't growing, so I'm pretty sure that the Brondo's not working. Now, I'm no botanist, but I do know that if you put water on plants, they grow. Well, I've never seen no plants grow out of no toilet. Hey, that's good. You sure you ain't the smartest guy in the world? Yeah. (laughs) Okay, look. You want to solve this problem. I want to get my pardon, so why don't we just try it, okay? And not worry about what plants crave. Brando's got what plants crave. Yeah, it's got electrolytes. What are electrolytes? Do you even know? It's what they use to make Brando. Yeah, but why do they use them to make Brando? Because Brando's got electrolytes. On to the judgment section, which is what we were doing. Yes. So, judging the film, judging Mike Judge, Dustin, is Idiocracy a masterpiece or a museum piece, regardless of what Sarah Driver thinks. Irregardlessly, think? so as to piss off all the English people here. <laughs> I think that it is a very funny film. I very much enjoy it. I can look past a lot of the inconsistencies because it's a world that's not going to make sense. Satire is going to be a bit ridiculous just the way that it is. And it is pretty spot on in ways that I kind of wish it wasn't. But one of the things of satire is that it is, to an extent, topical and always will be. It is a thing that will work within a time and a place within a specific culture. And that, to me, based off my definition of a masterpiece being timeless, 
satires are pretty much can't be timeless. There will always be a museum piece as it's always going to represent a time and a place. It's a commentary on a society, even concepts within that society. And I'd like to think that eventually we're going to hit a point where we're going to watch Idiocracy and be like, this film doesn't even make any sense anymore. None of these things are issues. What are we talking about with dumb people having a whole lot of kids and adver advertisements being everywhere and trying to sell everything with sex? Like, this is all ridiculous to me. I don't understand. I'm in the year 2505, and this film does not accurately represent my world. <laughs> what are electrolytes anyways, and where, where do they come from? <laughs> <laughs> What's a sports drink? That doesn't even make sense. I thought water was a sports drink. If you want to hydrate, you drink water. Like, what? this is crazy. Don't say hydrate around Lewis Black. Okay. <laughs> I must not have seen that one. Heard that one. But yes, it it belongs in a museum. Which is, is funny museum because piece. the time machine was in the museum area. <laughs> and was really bad at explaining the and, past. And this film for me, is in the museum area. If it's a bunch of idiots who made that script for the museum, because it, of course, was completely incorrect, how did they build the trolleys and all that, and all the... They probably repurposed that. that stuff, but they still had to, like... They still had to put the animatronics together. Put dinosaurs and stuff in there. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go museum piece with this as well. It's, it is a, it's a good satire, it's a funny movie, but... You know, Office Space was satire too, and I feel like Office Space said more and was smarter. I think Idiocracy is a missed opportunity for all the reasons that we said in the prior discussion. Ultimately, I think it fell to the writing because I think a lot of the other factors really are working in the film's favor and are probably the reason why the film is as good as it is. But, you know, I hate to relegate a comedy because there are so few comedies <laughs> to the museum rather than a masterpiece. But I disagree with you on the whole satire being locked into a certain time I'm frame. I'm pretty sure that there's going to be exceptions to that and that I'm going to be uh, eating my words at some point on it. I but, agree with you. But for now, it's... I agree with you in terms of we might look at something and go, that doesn't even mean anything to us anymore. But it meant to someone at some point and if you know anything about the world that you've lived in, it's probably referencing something you understand and you can appreciate the satire for what it is. Although I think there are things out there like Duck Soup, like Dr. Strangelove, which are all dealing with kind of war and authority and military. And sadly, <laughs> I mean, when did Duck Soup come out? It was like the 30s. Still kind of weirdly, hilariously relevant. But there is still a lot within Duck Soup which works independently of all else. True. Independently of satire. True. So, yeah. I don't even know if I'd recommend it. I think if you were a fan of Office Space and Mike Judge, I'd be like, yeah, you should probably check it out. But really not a strong recommend. Uh, enough to be a museum piece. I'm not going to outright vote this one off the island. Put it on the trash heap under the trash avalanche. So, yeah, that's my feelings on it. Those are our feelings on it. That belongs in a museum. I will say it's been nice. We've we've covered a few comedies. We had like Fast Times. We had Big Lebowski. We've got this one. Uh, I think there might be one more in there that I'm forgetting. But it's been nice to have included as many comedies as we have in the last little bit. I'm trying to remember a single aspect of Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And I cannot do it. Spicoli ordering a pizza to class. Ah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I remember Spicoli now. And Fast Times we kinda oh. we kinda argued at the time like it's a comedy, but it's not really like a funny haha -ha comedy in the sense that like Animal House would be a comedy sort of thing. I have a feeling I'm really gonna hate Animal House. Oh, Which I look forward to hating on that. I have never seen it before, but I I have that impression. Actually we've got uh we've got a comedy We've got one straight-up comedy and one completely unintentional comedy coming up in June. <laughs> As part of a plan that we will announce soon. In the future. 
Oh, actually, we can announce that now because the next episode is going to be the first part. So <laughs> I realized the other day that uh, this being 2019, it's uh, 30 years since 1989. And 1989 was a summer where there was a string of movies that were coming out almost like one week after another that I was very excited by franchises that I loved and followed, new movies that were coming out that were supposed to be amazing. Those included uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, uh, Ghostbusters 2, Star Trek 5, and the 1989 Batman. I think it's just the four. There might be one more. But that was like a huge landmark. Seminal year for you. Seminal year for me, yeah. Um, so we're going to do sort of a Summer of 89 series. And we're going to talk about those movies. We're going to revisit those movies. I'm going to revisit those movies. Uh, Dustin is going to re watch them with me. And uh... I was five at the time, so <laughs> I don't. I don't think I saw any of these films at the time. And I have no memories of that year. We're going to see kind of what I think of them thirty years on. I know my opinions on some of them have changed, and some of them I haven't seen in a really long time. And I'm curious to kind of go back to. And Dustin hasn't seen Batman in forever so he wants like to 20 years totally wants to go back and watch it so yeah that's going to be kind of the next thing the next uh, episode will be indiana jones and the last crusade and that will kick off our summer of 89 series so that's it for our discussion on idiocracy if you have any thoughts or feelings about the episode about the film about our thoughts about the film feel free to let us know uh, either on our facebook or twitter uh, you can contact us on our Instagram as well as YouTube, our very active YouTube comment section. Uh, find us on Facebook to search for your consideration or FYC show. Find us on Twitter at FYC show. Instagram is FYC show. Uh, we've got an email, FYC show mail at gmail.com. And there's also the WordPress blog, which is FYC show dot WordPress dot com. If you want to support the show, if you enjoy the content that we create, uh, we would love it if you subscribed, liked, and shared across uh, all the platforms. Share us with family and friends, social media. Give us a link. Give us a retweet. Give us a share. And if you want to support the show a little more robustly, we do have the Patreon, patreon.com slash FYC show. You can go there. You can um, throw us a little scratch. Helps keep the lights on. Uh, helps us develop and uh, keep producing content for you guys. So that's it for the pandering. <laughs> <laughs> Dustin, it has been a pleasure speaking movies with you. It would be. It is always a pleasure for people who get to talk to me. And thank you, dear listener, so much for giving us your time, for joining us, either every episode or just for this episode. We appreciate it endlessly. You give us a reason to continue. So that's it for me. Uh, until next time, I've been your host, Mike Josick. And I've been your other host, Dustin Friesenham. Take care, and we'll see you on the next For Your Consideration. Arrivederci. Sorry, I'm burping up my lasagna. <laughs>